thanks for coming. I'm, uh, I'm a little intrigued to know why you're here, since almost nothing was written in the program. And it either tells me you have a high passion for adventure and ambiguity, or you were really like not at all interested in what was happening next door. But, um, but anyway, thanks for coming. Um, uh, this is a panel I'm, I'm really excited about. Uh, I'm, my name is Mark Prelo. I do business at Mapbox. Uh, and I'm going to moderate the panel, but, but really the exciting stuff is, uh, is the folks behind me. Um, what we wanted to talk about a little bit is, uh, you know, we're, we're here in a city, if you, if you heard uh, Dexter's presentation this morning, Detroit is really doing a lot around tying mobility systems into the infrastructure of the city. And, and mobility has been this big term uh, that that's, it sort of gets a lot of things stuffed into it. Um, but there's a piece that cities are playing, there are pieces that companies are playing, and of interest here, there's pieces that open data and open communities can play. And that's really what we wanted to talk about um, uh, on this panel. And, and so uh, we're going to do it. Uh, we've got uh, a bunch of questions to go through. If you are dying. all the audience mics, so wave your hand wildly, shout it out, I will reinterpret it into a question we'd like to answer and then we'll give it a shot or something like that. We'll, uh, but we'll try and have some time for audience questions uh, at the end, but, but if you have something you're passionately involved in, don't stand on principle. Um, so let me just start, I'm going to start over here uh, with, with Mark Dillaverne, I think I said that right. Uh, Mark's title is the Chief of Mobility Innovation at the City of Detroit, and I was guessing that that title, Chief of Mobility Innovation, is a title that did not exist 10 years ago in the city of Detroit. And so my question, just tell us what that is and what was the things that changed in Detroit that gave rise to, uh, to that position? Sure. So it's a, it's a new title. Uh, it's kind of a virus that's now spreading to cities across who everyone's trying to start a, a mobility innovation. But basically, um, there was the US DOT Smart City Challenge uh, about two and a half, three years ago, where the federal government said, we have a $50 million winner take all um, for who can basically be the smart city. Um, and just like Amazon, uh, everybody said $50 million, like where do I sign up? Um, so everybody began to, to put together an application. And, and in Detroit, I don't think this is something that we were like, we had our eyes on and said, this is, this is gonna be critical and we're gonna go to it. But um, a lot of people um, put a lot of effort to begin to put together a, an application. It was a decent application, we weren't shortlisted. Um, but began to, to get um, the mayor on down, beginning to think of, you know, the world's about to change a lot. Um, it's changing quickly with, with disruptions um, from Uber and Lyft to the idea of autonomous vehicles. Um, and, you know, being, being where we are um, with partners at Ford, GM, and all the tier ones, um, as well as the, the work that we need to have to do in mobility, the idea of having someone in an office to be the, the focal point of how we begin to think through the future was uh, the idea to start. So, um, you know, basically my job is to one, get new stuff up and running. Um, and whether that's pilots with um, TNCs or microtransit to scooters, um, to beginning to think through like how is this all gonna work in the future? Um, and thinking through things like data and payment and mobility operating and these, these words that were never used before um, and I'm a little underqualified to deal with. Um, but you know, we put together, you know, we have a great team, Dexter, Dexter being part of it, um, that are, I'm, I'm very blessed by the fact that um, all of our, our folks and our, our do a team all really like bikes and transit and thinking through this. So like they, it's easier for me to make an ask of them than maybe like a, a building inspector because they're also passionate about the subject. So uh, Mark actually stole a little bit of my next introduction because one of the big reasons that jobs like that exist is because of change. One of the companies that's driven the change has been Uber. And so Emily Strand is the policy and public data engagement what does that mean and why does Uber want to do it? Sure. Yeah, so I lead, um, I set a, kind of a, a mixed role between the uh, public policy and communications team at Uber and then also with our product team, um, specifically working on Uber Movement, which is uh, Uber's data sharing platform um, to, to actually share aggregate anonymized data, um, trip data uh, with cities uh, to, to help provide some of the, the insights that they need uh, in order to adjust rapidly to the rapid amount of change that's happening. Um, so, yeah. Good. Welcome. Um, Kevin Webb is next. Kevin is the director of Shared Streets. He has the 
uh, uh, unique honor, as far as I know, of getting Uber and Lyft to agree to something on the same press release for the first time ever, I think. So uh, tell us what Shared L Streets is and what, yeah, how, that, yeah, so what, how that vision is. Shared came. Streets is a, a nonprofit organization that's kind of trying to work in the, the kind of middle ground between public and private and help coordinate these sort of things. And actually, more than just getting people on the first, on the first press release, we, I think it was the first time the CEO of Uber and the first time the CEO of Lyft actually been on the same stage or even met it's each other. So try, international yeah, diplomacy yeah. with data is kind of the brokerage is kind of what's going on in there. Good, yeah. good, welcome. And, and last but not least, Dave Clifford, a, a local, is with, is a chief AI and ML scientist at GMIT or, or GM? General Motors. Okay, General Motors, okay. And, and you know, interesting, in, obviously in Detroit, uh, OEMs are a huge part of it. A lot of times we think of OEMs as making cars, but how is GM thinking about these questions about map data and, and, and how companies like GM can kind of inform what happens on the map? Sure. So. Um my office is in our global data, AI, and analytics services part of the organization. So um, when we think about maps and we think about working with some external organizations, we have to agree about where things like street corners are, right? We have to agree about things like curvature of the average road or where crosswalks are, how many bike lanes exist. Um, and so in a lot of ways, we rely on multiple sources of data about the changing world. Um, and OSM's great because it's comprehensive and computational in nature. So OSM measures a lot of stuff in an open way and is uh, very uh, explanatory when you try and figure out what an element in the data structure means. There's a ton, a ton, a ton of resources for it. So in a machine learning group or in an AI group that looks at problems that a uh, very large company like General Motors has uh, across a gamut of um, emerging business spaces. Uh, we really rely on things like OSM so that if I'm talking about where we could put a charging station into an area uh, with someone like Mark to support EV charging in the city, we can both agree on where that street corner is and we can have a common interchange language or a lingua franca. You know, we've talked with Shared Streets IO about some of these same challenges. So, you know, from an, from an IT guy perspective and from an AI perspective, uh, having that common data resource and that common data dictionary is so extensively important to us and it allows us to build, to build software product that's used by large stakeholder communities and we really kind of look forward to sort of what's gonna emerge next. So um, let me just, the way we've sort of thought this out is, is really to kind of address in three parts. And one is, what is the issue of mobility? And, and what, what does that mean? What are the main issues? Um, the second part we want to talk about a little bit is, given that change in mobility and given that that's something new, what does that mean for, uh, for, for data? How, how do things have to evolve? And then the third question that we wanted to address is how do the various stakeholders, or the various people represented here, which include uh, companies, uh, it, in it includes cities, it includes open data communities, how do they work together and what will they have to do to work together going forward? So that's kind of where we're going. Uh, I'll stand awkwardly in the middle and ask questions to people <laughs> behind my back. Um, and you tell me if they're making faces or something. Um, so, so let me just start asking you, Mark. Uh, one of the things I think, you know, mobility becomes this term, like many terms in, in uh, business, that just gets expanded and stretched and no one really knows what it means. Thinking about as the head of innovation for Detroit Mobility, there's probably a list of 20 things. What are kind of the top two or three things that, that kind of concern you about mobility for Detroit going forward in the next few years? Well, I mean, we, the mayor is very focused on just very clearly just making it easier, safer, and more affordable for folks to get around the city, right? Like, so everything has to fit under that umbrella. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we've been doing over the last few years, and we've got to keep going. We have a strategic plan that we just released of, you know, improving our bus surface, increasing the amount of buses that are out there, making it easier for people to pay, um, adding more, more bike lanes, improving the way that we do our traffic management. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff. And if you go out, um, like if I go out to Seven and Schaefer in a neighborhood and basically say, like, you know, what, what, is, what do you want us to do? Um, you know, they're not going to say things like, 
you know, we need pedestrian video, pedestrian detection that automatically creates AI and, and changes the traffic signal or... In says, Silicon Valley, they do, actually. Yeah, or, or anything around like, um, you know, we need you to, you know, these are the data requirements we need scooter companies. They're like, you know, make it safer to cross the street. Yeah. You know, give us another option to get around. Like that, that's where it is. So, so when we're doing these things and, and you know, the challenge becomes of, um, you know, how how you put the focus and how what we're going to be doing actually has an impact and drives outcomes. Um, because there's, there's not, you know, there's so many people with so many great ideas and they're all over the place, but we're still a pretty small city and we have, you know, limited resources. So how do we get the most for, most impact um, when we're investing our time, which is our, our biggest capacity? But, but a lot of those things, safety, getting around the city, congestion, are not new issues. And yet this idea of mobility is seems to be really doing something dramatically different. Is that being driven by consumer expectations growing or new technologies being available? Or how, how would you kind well, of I mean, I think it's just change? the fact that there are more things that are out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, before we talked about, like, you probably said, like, I, it's a binary, it's like, it's not binary, but I drive, I take the bus, I bike, right? Like, that's, that's how I get around. Um, where now we have just, just so many more options. Um, and that's really what we're driving for is that like, we have a, there's a lot more going on in the city than there was four years ago and we need more options to get people around. Yeah. Um, you know, so how does that all, but it, at the same time, like, you know, Detroit and almost every other city, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of things, right? Like it's not a system, it doesn't all work together. Um, and that's kind of where everyone, Detroit, cities across America are trying to drive to is like, how do you make that as seamless as possible? So. Let me switch over here and ask. So Uber is known for obviously cars and ride sharing. More recently, bikes hinting at a lot of other things. How does Uber sort of look at cities as a, as a well, let me ask the question. How is Uber now looking at mobility across all those different modes? But then also, how is Uber looking at partnering with cities? Yeah, so I mean, we're in an exciting time, I think. You know, the the amount of change that is happening, and I know that sounds cliche, but the amount of change that's happening right now, in in particular around micro mobility, um, is just it's it's rapid and it's very very exciting. And I think that that one of the things that we're thinking about is, you know, how do we we I think the 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 good part about being um, in this conversation is that we're aligned with cities on a lot of these issues. Mm -hmm. You know, Uber's thinking about how do we safely, affordably, sustainably move people around very dense urban areas. And, and I think that there's a, a lot of alignment between cities. I think we're thinking about cities as partners more so now than ever, hence why, you know, they hired me and I, I get to, to uh, create products like Uber Movement that's specifically designed um, for urban planners and and, uh, and for cities, and um, you know we're we're trying to lean into that alignment of where we are aligned and and just kind of having that understanding that personal car ownership isn't the final answer and it can't be the final answer as we're as we're growing and as these these technologies are emerging and and giving us more options so about a week ago don't don't give the mic yet i'm going to ask you uh you you and kevin's group shared streets had an announcement why was uber interested in maybe i should ask kevin tell us about shared or what, what why don't i ask you since you got the mic why were you interested in doing that, that i mean that's a collaborative effort what was sort of the motivation for uber in that yeah, so I think um, so. A, a week ago, we announced um, a couple things with Shared Streets. One of them is a, a $250,000 investment in, in Shared Streets. Um, and one of the things that we know is a challenge for cities, is a challenge for um, companies, is, is interoperability. Um, and aligning around shared standards. And, and that's some of the work that Kevin's uh, group uh, that Shared Streets has been doing and that we're investing in on a, as long-term solutions. You know, that is um, just a major problem to, that needs to be solved and that we heard from our you know, city partners over and over again is you, know, you just handing us data when it doesn't align with anything else doesn't work. Um, and so that's, you know, some of the exciting work I think Kevin's doing. And, and Kevin, how is Shared Streets, what, how do you kind of see that? What, what, 
give us a little bit more about how shared streets, because I think, I think it's one thing to have data, it's another thing to give data, it's another thing to make data actually usable. Yeah, so there's, there's two problems we're solving here, and they're actually kind of interesting to break apart. The first problem is really we have to have a language to talk to each other, and we've got all these boundaries right now. We've got people in silos with different languages, and when they want to talk, there's just this enormous amount of friction to overcome that, and that creates this like just massive like divisions that don't need to be there. So we started Shared Streets like going to the companies and like working with the engineering teams, really. It starts inside of the technical level to say, how do we get you to like solve this problem in the language? And once you get over the language issue, all of a sudden there's the next problem, which is this data governance and kind of coordination problem that happens. And like once you've solved the language issue, got people invested in a technical solution, the governance problems actually become a lot less complicated. And as a result of that, you get the CEOs, not just of, you know, of Uber saying we're gonna do this, but of Lyft and Ford, getting up there together saying this is something collectively we actually can see this as a solution. But do you see, and in, in I'll go, sorry, keep uh, going back to this, I mean, do you see, I mean, one of the questions for anyone is, is every city going to do something a little different, or is there going to be, you know, is, is, is Mark going to talk to his counterpart in Indianapolis? How, how do you see that happening? Is, is there a federal role in this, or is, or is it going to be loosely coordinated? Or how do you see some of these, these common standards sort of proliferating other than city by city? So um, one of the things that I used to do is I used to work with the Institute of Medicine on uh, transitioning to electronic health, medical, electronic health records that you could do things like machine learning and AI on there. And they came up with a short standard called the blue button right, that was a consumer-centric standard. And I think, you know, um, one of the good things about shared streets is that you guys think about who the consumers of mobility data are, right, whether the, mobility, whether the consumers of the mobility data are an app developer or a city transit official and, or someone like an OEM, and thinking about that interchange layer as being the thing that enables us to build those more technical solutions and then want to continue to use that interchange modality, right? Like, we didn't just wake up one morning and we agree, and everyone agreed on TCP/IP in order to build the internet. Like someone said, TCP/IP is a reasonable standard. It had a standards committee, and it's a reasonable way to push data around that everyone can understand and decode a packet in the same way. I think what Shared Streets is trying to do is figure out what that packet-level definition is for mobility data that lets a lot of people who are trying to consume or publish into publish or subscribe into that system work with it well. I think what we've seen in the past is microcosms of this and things like GTFS. But GTFS sort of became a deprecated product and there was a lot of, so GTFS is the yeah, Google. I want to give just 30, 15 seconds on the history of GTFS. Yeah, so GTFS is uh, Google's transit feed specification. I think, it, I think it's general now. General transit, but, yeah. right. It started, but it, started as Google exactly. and then became general. And it was a way for cities to publish where their subway lines were to Google yeah. as a mapping entity. Um, and then it became something that was supported and sustained in the open community. But no one really, I don't think that many firms worked with cities to provide someone like Mark an easy option for his buses to publish where they were to GTFS in a consistent basis. And I think what, what things like Shared Streets might be able to do is help us figure out in that static layer of map content, how can we interchange? And in that dynamic layer of map content, how can we interchange? And those sorts of things are really important for building an ecosystem that's based on choice. Whether that's a lot of people who can't use Uber because of where they live, being able to continue to own a personal car, which, you know, we're an OEM, we think we're still gonna be in business. You like that um, but I think it does help people make those mobility choices at a more granular level on a, in, when they're inside a city center or a city core. Yeah, no, I mean, so this is one of the things that scares me a lot that I'm going to screw up big time uh, <laughs> of, of doing, some, doing, a, doing something that holds us back five years from now, right? And, like, this is where I, I get trepidation because, you know, this is, this you is new. You choose Betamax versus VHS yeah, or something like that. Yeah, um, that this is, this is sorry, so new. Sorry, parents if you don't know. Um, uh, and this is kind of where there's coordination. So Molly's here from, from NACTO, and NACTO has been, is a North American city transportation official, and they're kind of the glue trying to hold hold everyone together and being able to kind of communicate to that, yeah, I mean, people want to push, right? And cities want to be, you know, cities like to be first and cities like to say, like, we're, we're the first one, one doing this. Um, but, you know, I think that we've, we've heard from, from companies is like, we can't build different things for every single city, right? Yeah. And, you know, we, I'm, I'm fully cognizant of that, right? Like, our market is not big enough to, like, tell Uber you have to do something very specific to come to Detroit because then Uber can easily say, well, we don't just not go to Detroit. Um, 
And so that's you know why we're working with with Kevin and his team um, because I think that's it's going to be necessary for it to be just easy. So, so you know, just precisely, precisely to this point, um, we're doing an analysis because our group does analysis of different mobility patterns in different cities, and looking at a very, very small subset of cities, we were trying to spend more of our time building products, doing analysis, and shipping. Like any, I think most people in this room are software developers or work with software development organizations. You want to spend your time shipping, and you want to spend your time shipping features that people can touch, right? But what we found in the beginning of this effort was that 50% of the time in our first sort of six-month phase was spent trying to figure out a model to ingest and parse data from a very small subset of cities, and that's unsustainable for anyone, right? That prevents, there's a hundred cities in the United, I mean, there's, a, in the, if you look at the top hundred cities in the United States, there's not common standards among those cities. So we really look at stuff like shared streets and we look at stuff like OSM to convene around that. And can, I, can I add something onto this? About yeah. the, so there's a really critical part about the public sector side of this that I think is, is, is hard to see if you're not in the public sector. You've got these like really hard lines that are drawn around your cities. And if you look at Detroit, there's actually cities inside the city in Detroit that are like hard yeah. lines and there are all these little silos of data. If you're a private company, you operate like Google or, 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 or Uber, or, you know, the kind of scale they operate, the world has no boundaries. Like the data spans the entire globe. It's almost like a superpower to think about things without boundaries. And when you're in the public sector, you don't get a choice. And so one of the things we're trying to figure out right now is how do we help the folks that are in those lines that are not gonna move, step out and take kind of a global view. And I think it really requires like, like a deep commitment to actually help th them work with the companies and actually see this as like a common framework that we're gonna operate globally and still find a way to land it in a city. So. And I, I think one of the things that's challenge, we love OSM, we love OSM, we love OSM, we love OSM. We gotta fork the ODBL, right? The open database license, because the ODBL is primarily sustained through commentary published by OSM, and the ODBL as a license in itself is very difficult to interpret, and so it's really good. The share alike clause in it doesn't do what it's intended to do, so someone needs to fork it if we want to have a share alike clause do what it's intended to do in the context of OSM around the globe. Because American copyright law and European copyright law and European database law and American database law don't agree, right? And the ODBL treats it as one size fits all. I don't think that we need, like CC did this. CC has a V3. CC has, you know, so CC 0.0, .0 is useful. CC 3.0 is useful. And we can, look, Eric, we can have this fight after class. <laughs> right? But we're ha like, our, our council staff and our IT staff, we, we want to build more stuff with OSM, and we want to figure out what we can give back to OSM. I think Shared Streets gives us the opportunity to figure out how to create a public commons where stuff can be published at a more nuanced level than OSM does right now. So I think that what, what Eric's saying is that uh, our, our council is really interested in actually publishing about this. Um, there's a guy in our council's office who's really interested in this, and Eric, we should probably get together and write that article. You guys will meet outside. No, so, <laughs> okay. but, so, but like, uh, so this is this is where it's hard for cities, right? Like, I have very very smart people um, that are that are working some of these issues, but like, I have no idea what you guys just talked about, right? Like, uh, uh, and like, poor Kevin. Like, Kevin's had to spend so many hours with me to just sort of explain. I, explain I just get to the lucky that we. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, and it's, 
you know, and you know, you, you're bringing people that have traditionally, you know, come through engineering and planning and city building type type spaces here that are kind of urbanists and don't have any of this technologist background, right? And how you begin to sort of not have them be in the same rooms, but kind of begin to merge them um, is going to be a growing pain um, because it, this is all just so so new um, to the majority of people at a city. So in a way, I mean, you're, it, that's sort of an interesting comment because in a way, you are the customer for whether we're a open data community building data that we hope will be used, whether we're a company hoping to use that open data in whatever it is, what do you want I mean, from, a, from open data? I mean, what, how do you want that presented? What do you want to be able to do? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Or do you not want it? I mean, it? I think that's, that, that's what we're trying to, <laughs> yeah. to still begin to figure out um, mm -hmm. and better understand from, from the companies as well. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I mean, w one of the things that, you know, over the last few years, everyone has just been like data, 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 cities, we need data or data. I, that was weird how I just said that differently. But um, <clears throat> we all quickly, you know, when, when Uber started saying, here's all the data you can have, like, it's like, oh, great, we can't do anything with this, right? Because there's no, we don't have tons of data scientists and the, the computing power to actually do anything with it. Um, so I, I think that, you know, for me, I mean, well, we're, what I, what I want to start to do is just begin to, to pick off a question here or a question there, right? Like, of just beginning to say, this is something that we've not been able to answer. Like, let's try and answer that um, and not have to spend a significant amount of money, but if it's just simply something of, and this is what we're even working with with GM, is just like, why is traffic good or bad on a day, right? And because we don't have significant amount of traffic, but it's, it's very noticeable when something has gone wrong. Um, and just being able to use metrics to basically say like, so then we can we can talk to the mayor and say, this is this is what happened and this is uh, this is how we actually went out and responded. And just to, to add on to that, I mean, so with uh, Movement, which is the, the data sharing platform that, that Uber released about 18 months ago, um, we announced last week that the next data set that we're going to be publishing is actually street segment level speeds data. And that was not just out of the blue, it was out of conversations with cities saying, you know, we actually don't have a great consistent data set um, or if we do, it's very expensive. It largely relies on service vehicles, so it's not comprehensive of, of really the, the roadways at large. Um, and, and having that street, uh, that actually street level speeds data would be really, really useful in understanding traffic patterns, understanding congestion, and starting to get at some of those root causes. And we're able to do that by it's still pr pr still protecting rider driver policy, which is or, um, rider driver privacy, which is very important to us by providing a, a, at an aggregate level. Um, and so I think that you know what what the conversation where we're trying to move it is: can we start to provide insights rather than can we provide just bulk data to cities? Kevin, I'm just kind of curious. I mean, one of the other things that's happening with mobility is the types of data that are needed to kind of enable that is just, I don't know if exploding is too dramatic a word, but certainly expanding a lot. I mean, there, there are things, you know, for instance, what's the curb marking, which was not something that a lot of people were mapping before, and now it's a hype. How are you thinking about, like, outside of, of the, the legal and license requirements of the data, what types of data are, yeah, are it's, out it's there? It's actually a, it's a really hard question to, to think about when you look at it as like a monolith. You just think of transportation or movement, you know, mobility data as a, as a monolithic thing. But if you break it into parts, it actually makes a little more sense. And the way we think about it is like the first layer of this is really the physical infrastructure. It's the stuff the city owns. Like it's the, the hard pavement. It's the rules and laws that are on top of that. That physical layer is like the foundation for a lot of this. And we actually really have to invest in that data. It's actually one of the most underinvested pieces of data, data infrastructure. One one of the things in the session just a while ago from Philip, who's sitting over there, Philip, was the, the amount of things that need to be mapped. Exactly. Either they weren't mapped and now they need to be mapped at all, or they need to be mapped and in they greater need, they precision. Need be, they need to be mapped differently, too, because we used to map them to manage asphalt. So we'd go map, we have these incredibly precise, like centimeter level maps of cities that were specifically for buying concrete and asphalt. And now we have to map them to be able to run a mobility company on top of it. Totally different map to do that. So there's this reinvestment in the physical infrastructure. The second layer of data is really about the movement of things and people. And we've actually never had that data before. So you know, companies like Uber are collecting it at a massive scale for the first time in history. You know, companies like Google and Apple, you know, they have like people out there with phones getting that data. So now we have to think about how do we organize and manage that data on the movement side. And the third level, and this is the part that is really complicated, and unfortunately it's where most people start, 
there's this marketplace level, which is actually the kind of coordination of people and things and the kind of pricing and delivery of services. That's a whole different set of data that's actually how you kind of manage the transportation system. And that's a level that is happening inside apps, it's happening inside these private marketplaces. And we have to think about how we start to connect those together. But you only can do it if you break them apart first and look at them individually. And then you think about how do you recombine them as a city and start to make sense out of what's actually going on. Um, so what's pre-competitive, I think, is another way to talk about this, right? And GM and Ford and other tier ones team up in an organization called Camp today. And one of the things that Camp does is it looks at V to X and V to I infrastructure in the United States and how we should do things like build smarter traffic lights that are more context aware for zero crash. And we care about that as a car company because we make cars. Um, but, you know, the car companies aren't afraid of pre-competitive spaces that help everyone. Give, uh, define what you mean by pre-competitive. Uh, we don't make more money exclusively when the traffic light is better, right? We, if we want to have a forward collision alert system in our car that says I hit the brakes really hard, a car behind me, regardless of the manufacturer, should be able to catch that message and understand that you know I'm hitting the brakes really hard. Um, but you know we, we've historically thought about this as a product level whether it's a signalized intersection or whether it's a car. And we haven't thought about that in the, in the sphere that our product operates in, right? Signalized intersections, or smart intersections are really, really, really good, but we don't know how many stoplights are in the United States, right? Um, bicycle infrastructure or things that protect vulnerable road users are really good, but we don't know where bike lanes are or where crosswalks are or how many bike lanes there are, or which ones are protected and which ones aren't protected. OSM is a really good source for a lot of that information, but to, if we want to get at these things of mode choice, right, what's the best way for me to get from my origin to destination quickly, most quickly? We should be able to tell people how they can do that safely, right? We should be able to tell people where the bike lanes are, we should be able to tell people where the crosswalks are, and we should be able to tell our cars where the bike lanes are and where the crosswalks are. These things are really important and they're pre, I, I will say that my belief is that these things are important for everyone. Our CEO would say that she believes in zero crash, zero emission, and zero congestion. And zero crash and zero congestion are enabled by us knowing where pedestrians are, knowing where bicyclists are, and coming up with better ways to protect those vulnerable road users, not just people that are sitting in one of our products. So if we, if we kind of put this together, you know, you've got, you've got an, a, um, Mobility picture with all these different modes, all these different services growing in complexity uh, all the time. You've got new ways of collecting data and, and managing that data. Um, you've got uh, kind of an intersection of um, corporate community good, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, public good and corporate intersections. And, and so you have, and, and then we also have new types of data, new precision allocated to that data, and even dimensions of data that we didn't use to capture, right? Time is now a dimension of data that, that's not particularly well represented in OSM, for instance. Um, so to talk a little bit about um, open data, and specifically OSM, I think one of the things, just to, to sort of direction to go in the conversation is, how does a community like OSM, with a, a map like OSM, think about these emerging challenges in mobility? And you know, one of the things that uh, Kevin mentioned, and he ascribed it to Tim O'Reilly, though we weren't able to find that, so, so we may call it Kevin's theory, <laughs> is the, uh, uh, it's, it's something called the architecture of participation. And it, the idea is that new technologies have to be architected in a way that they work with other technologies. And I think you could apply the same to data. So I don't know, Kevin, give a better explanation of the, I think it really, I mean, this is really fundamental. I think in the, the Tim O'Reilly reference, it's a sad thing. It's an essay that fell off the internet, but it's worth rediscovering. It's the only thing it, it's, that's it's, ever it's, fallen it's, off It's really, the it just fell off. You think it wouldn't happen with Tim, like, having written it, but it did. And the, it's about really how, like, you know, operating systems move from being this kind of monolith to being a framework for people to engage and how it really changed the corporate culture. And we had Linux as, like, a resource to bring these companies together. And I think we're at the same moment where we've done, we're seeing that with data, like you were just saying, where now we've got, you know, these kind of data layers that actually link companies rather than actually divide them. And I think OpenStreetMap is a really fantastic example of that. It's really 
a Rosetta Stone for like a lot of the what's happening in the transportation world right now. But we have to frame it in that way and, and actually really make it as a as a link rather than something that is like kind of a, an all or nothing kind of monolith. And I think that's that's what the architecture of distribution really gets at is everybody can kind of take it on their own terms. Everybody can show up and add to it, but it's there for you to kind of make what you want rather than for it to decide how you use it. And are we there now? Sorry, I know. it's hard to address all of you. <laughs> So I think when it comes to things that OpenStreetMap, the, the ways that OpenStreetMap works are very good with things that have to do with space, right? If I think about the Cartesian world, right, OSM's good, um, extensive, extendable, right? I think one of the challenges that a lot of organizations are going to run into is um, how, how to work on things that have to do with time, Right? And I think that one of the major challenges there is that OSM as a data entity can't be a real-time data entity um, for a number of reasons. But I think one of the reasons is that it is very, 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 very open. Right? And so it's hard to publish accurate real-time data to an incredibly open entity and have that data be useful uh, on a like five second basis or a 10 second basis. So I think that that's where the, a, more, a more messaging system like interchange comes in. And I think that's really one of the major goals of shared streets is to have a, a reference layer like OSM where we can say, I don't need to know the names of roads anymore. I'm just gonna pick up OSM's names of roads. But then an interchange layer to be able to fast transact over data needs to be architected differently. And this is another one of these things where Mark, Mark wants things to work, right? So I think that leaves it up to guys like me and Kevin to figure out how to make it work, and hopefully people in this room to figure out how to consume and contribute to that body of work, right? And you know, I think I'll say like posting speed profiles in a context that you know, is a shared context is a really, really, really critical first step. And so I applaud you guys for doing that. And I'll just add that I think that the desire is there, right? And so I think we're, um, you know, we're at, at Uber thinking of cities as a as a customer, and and know that that what that means is that it needs to be useful, and so we're investing in shared streets and a number of other initiatives to to figure out how do we make it useful and how do we make it useful in in a time frame that is meaningful for cities. And digestible, and um, and that in, again is in alignment with what helps us. You know, so there's not this. This isn't just out of the goodness of our heart, right? It is in our best interest that cities are aligned on in, and there's standards that are aligned globally, um, and and it and it can work for all sides. Is there an active conversation? And you may or may not be able to say this. Is there an active conversation in Uber about which data? is better in commons versus which data? Because Uber collects a lot of intelligence and, and you know around the world from your operations. That's presumably competitive intelligence. Is that an active discussion on where that line is? I think that, I mean, what I, what I can say is that there's a lot of conversation about how do we continue to use this model that we've created that we think is fairly successful um, through movement and through shared streets. Uh, which is how do we provide aggregate anonymized data that protects our, the privacy of our riders and drivers and provides meaningful, useful insights for, for cities in particular. And I think we've, we've made huge strides on that. I mean, you saw last year when we, when we came out with movement, um, it was uh, zone to zone travel times, uh, street, uh, street segment level speeds data is next. We also last week, um, published a, a kind of first pilot with, with Washington, D.C. Um, through Shared Streets, which was showed to pick up drop-off uh, locations. That was in conjunction with Lyft and the taxi operating systems. So that, I mean, you're, that is being published. Like the, I think the proof is in the pudding a little bit, and like we're, that we're moving forward on some of these conversations that have been stuck in the past. 
Can I add something? There's something really interesting to learn, actually, when you look at this from like the competitive privacy kind of standpoint or kind of business privacy standpoint, if you reframe the data as an answer to a question rather than as a raw data set, you often can find a way to frame it that doesn't get at the thing that's concerned. And there's like, that comes up for personal privacy. So if you frame it as like, I want all the movement data, all the trip level data, massive privacy concern. If you say, I want to know how people are moving, you can answer that question with the same data with a different lens. Same thing comes up when the corporate privacy side. If you say, I want to know like where Uber makes its most money, you know, if you, you have a data set that's like talking about trip transactions, you could ask that and that'd be a really threatening conversation from, privacy, from business privacy. You turn around and say like, how does a mobility service work in a city? And you can frame it in a way that's not threatening to Uber. It's especially true if you can start to combine multiple companies together in aggregate. And that's what we did in DC. We took the taxi data, Lyft data, Uber data, we merged them together because we had a framework for doing that. And all of a sudden it wasn't about Uber or it wasn't about Lyft, it was about the combined view of what was going on in the city. We've got, sorry, didn't, any more? Um, I'd like to open up for a little bit for audience questions, if there are some, a uh, couple different things around. And uh, unfortunately, there's not a mic, so if you shout it, I'll repeat it and uh, go from there. Uh, yeah, right there. Uh, is Uber and other companies like that releasing bulk GPS traces? Let me repeat the question. Uh, so I think the question, not if I got it right, is Uber and other companies really releasing bulk GPS traces, and I think you said to uh, find street geometries. Did I get that kind of right? -ish? So, I, so I, can, I can talk about the bulk geometry, you know, the bulk GPS uh, idea in principle. We're actually interested in how we can prevent that from happening, actually, because one of the, there's a lot of privacy concerns when you start getting down to trace level information. So we're interested in how can we turn the traces into aggregates. And one of the questions you're asking about is, like, can we improve the street geometry? Like, absolutely, yes. So this is something where there's an opportunity to start to merge these traces together into like a view of where the street actually might be and it might not be mapped correctly. And we can do that, but it's much, much uh, more desirable from a mapping standpoint to have it aggregated and you eliminate this privacy problem if you do that. So we really want to get people beyond the GPS data to the what are you going to answer with the GPS data. Uh, there's two parts to a construction zone, right? And we were talking about this the other day. One of them is the permit, right? And the permits are not electronically discoverable very well right now. These are the things that say construction will occur on this street between this time and this time, right? And that's not a rich data descriptor. Another one of the things that describes a construction zone are these aggregate GPS traces. And so, you know, I think that a lot of us who are in the community have thought about things like that, construction zone identification, right, as being one of these dynamic layers that I think is a really rich opportunity for Different, different groups to work together, different groups to work together, different people to work together on where are construction zones. People tell us, right? It's just hard for us to figure out where they told us. Um, and, you know, when we talk about the architecture of things, um, good, you know, there's the good fences make good neighbors, right? One of the, I think, one of the past models in in collaboration has been to build walled gardens. And I think that we're gonna be really challenged to help everyone if we keep on trying to figure out different ways to build walled gardens and charge rents on them. Um, so I think that when we, when we decide that this stuff is, is useful for broad communities of stakeholders, we should make sure that the garden that we build doesn't have any walls. Other questions? So just as a reminder, I'm going to try and repeat these, and my memory is very limited. I'll try and do this. The question was, are, is there a plan for TNCs and or municipalities to not only designate curb uh, spaces for delivery and pickup or, um, or drop off and pickup, but also maybe build infrastructure around those because those effectively become bus stops? Did I do that reasonably well? Okay. So um, 
Uh, actually, in, in kind of our bulk announcement last week, we had a, a couple exciting developments, I think, about the curb. Uh, one was we released a study. I never um, thought you'd be talking I, about exciting I know, developments exciting around developments curbs. Exciting developments about the curb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but it's so, true. The turn it's, your it's, life is taken. Very, very true. Um, so the first is um, we released a, a study with uh, Fair and Peers um, in San Francisco that actually uh, looked at a couple different types of curb spaces uh, around transit centers and commercial uh, uh, commercial like area zones, I guess. And, um, and, and that had some really powerful insights, I think. Um, we've also been working with Shared Streets on a, on a um, study in, in DC as well. Um, and that is to be published, yeah. So it, Yeah, so that, that data, I mean, and, and the early, I guess the early insights are, are really um, promising. Yeah, and I can add it on the DC side. I mean, what, what led to the, the kind of work we were doing with Uber in the kind of first stage of this was really saying, how can we give data back to the city to help them identify these places where these curbs are being used in new ways? And because of the, the use of the curb is changing dramatically. And this is, you know, the, the research is like, what does that mean? How do we react to it? The other question is, how can we like understand that change? And so, you know, we started a project in DC uh, that was actually driven by the city deciding to reallocate that space and then wanting to know, well, what happened as a result of that? Turns out we can measure that with the data that's coming from these companies. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess the way that, that, that I think of it is like, we have a fixed supply of curb and we have a fixed supply of sidewalk. Uh, for a while, we didn't have any issues with demand, so this was not sort of an issue you had to think about, but now we have all these different issues of demand that are sort of pulling us at the curb, and now starting with scooters pulling us at the sidewalk as well, um, and thinking through like how we best manage demand with a limited supply. Other questions? Mikhail. Um, Just repeat the question. So, Sorry. Oh, you oh, can. Okay. Uh, Mikkel asked, uh, I'll shorten it. Um, where do you see, where do you see uh, OSM especially going for automotive in the future? And he gave, said more wise things, but I forgot him. Uh, I think we have to democratize democracy. Um, God. I used to be a consultant. Sorry. I'm not anymore. Um, We've got two hashtags going in, or exciting curb developments yeah. and democratizing them. So um, one of the real challenges with OSM is that it's, I mean, how many of you guys live in cities that are smaller than 15,000 people? Hey, how many of you guys live in cities that, in, in states that have fewer than, you know, 500,000 people in them? Anybody? I mean, those states exist, right? There's counties that have less than 150,000 people in them, right? There's really small, there's, the quality of OpenStreetMaps today and for a, a lot of the richer features and its ability to maintain and be up to date, today is dependent on the population density of the area that it covers or someone's desire to care a lot about a really small town, right? This is a problem that we see in Wikipedia. A woman won the Nobel Prize this week and didn't have a Wikipedia entry, right? Because no, the people who edit Wikipedia didn't decide she was worth talking about. Right? So one of the challenges with OSM for automotive is that we have to decide that everywhere is worth talking about. Um, one of my colleagues here is in the room and we work a lot on maps for active safety and other future features together. And I swear if someone shows me another map of the amazing, amazing data they can get in downtown San Francisco, <laughs> The problem's Coeur d'Alene. Sorry, your the mic's being cut off. The problem, yeah. The problem's Coeur d'Alene, the problem's Twin Falls, the problem is Chippewa, the problem is, you know, it's, it is these areas where people still live and work and thrive. And if OSM wants to be for automotive, right, OSM has to consider those areas as much as it considers downtown San Francisco or, you know, the meatpacking district, or Washington, D.C. Like, I would love to be Muriel Bowser right now, because she is getting a ton, a ton of constituent services from these two guys down here, right? But I think one of the other challenges is, you know, if you're Mark, 
right? Or if you're someone who works on these issues in Windsor, right, across the border, we've got to care about those people too. And I think OSM has the power to care about those people, and automotive have the power to care about those people. And so I think we have to just figure out a way to, you know, democratize democracy and make sure that those people are cared about. Got time for one more? Yeah, right there. Yeah, so the, the question is about how do we think about the layering of kind of these different kinds of languages that are needed for applications. I think that's absolutely crucial to solving this problem. And I, and I want to say, like, our, our approach to this is, like, not to solve the whole thing. It's actually to start to say, like, what are the kind of unique building blocks you can build that help other people build other languages that actually then solve these problems? And I'm going to talk about this a lot more in detail at, at four-ish. I think there's a, a session just about the work we've been doing to kind of break that down. But the really quick answer is... You can't, you can't have one size fits all, and we've actually done this a lot with standards in the past. If you look at kind of history of the uh, kind of ITS and the kind of uh, transit, you know, transportation information landscape, there's these kind of monolithic standards that solve all the problems at once, and there's like a, you know, Congress says this has been fixed now, and so we're going to move on. And I think that's actually not how this stuff gets done. You actually have to give people tools and let people go use the tools and then apply them, and if the tools don't work, they have to build other tools, but you try to do the best you can to close the gap on that, and that really gets back to this architecture participation theory is that, you know, Nobody's going to own it. Like you got to like give everybody a framework to figure it out. So, okay, I think we're about out of time. Thank, thanks very much to the panel. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that the uh, challenge, and you know, I think as we hear a lot of things going forward, is. Um, we're, we've got a uh, ecosystem of data that gets increasingly complex. I think the opportunities for open data uh, get increasingly broad, but there are also challenges in terms of doing that in a uniform way, uh, while at the same time expanding kind of the dimensions that the, the data takes place in. And so I, I think it'll be an interesting space. Again, thanks very much. Thanks for uh, listening. And if you're passionate about oh, this stuff and oh, want a job, Please come and talk to right. me. And, and a very important announcement, I know not what is about to come. <laughs> if everybody's hungry, lunch will be served in room 420, sessions and workshops. and.